So our last speaker for the day on the execution stage is Roy Moore. Roy is a technical lead at SciSense. He has worked as a software engineer for early startups all the way through to the likes of Microsoft and Intel. He's worked on a range of fields, including cloud services, APIs, data engineering, where he claims to have written some, quote, beautiful bugs. I'd be keen to know what constitutes a beautiful bug, Roy. To top it all off, Roy is also a musician. I wonder if we'll get a variety act here today. Please welcome Roy Moore. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm assuming you can see my screen. <clears throat> All right, so uh, thanks for having me and, and thank you for being here. Special thanks to API Days and API Days Australia and New Zealand for um, organizing this entire conference uh, with so many interesting talks. Oh, right. Yeah, I think we can see you, but not your screen. Better now? Yeah, that's come through. That's great. OK, so good morning from Tel Aviv. That's where I'm at right now. Um, I know most of you are in a different time zone. Um, so this talk is entitled, Have Your Cake and Eat It Too, and refers to the choice between GraphQL and REST and how you can maybe have both together at the same time. So I'm actually going to talk just a little bit about the old uh, you know, GraphQL versus REST debate and mainly focus on the problem that we had and the solution we came up with that allows to have both together. And we, if we have some um, time left, we'll touch on, on the topic of GraphQL versus REST, specifically for the case of uh, public APIs. So uh, my name is Roy Moore. I'm a tech lead at a company called Sysense, and our product is a platform for BI and data analytics that uh, allows you to import data from almost any data source. These are just a few of the data sources. And then unify it into a single data repository, then make connections and relationships with different, between the different types of data, uh, run analysis operations on the data, and then generate um, cool dashboards to give you insight into that data. And those dashboards can later be embedded in your uh, application or website or uh, other devices or just for internal use. So <clears throat> as you can probably guess, um, this is a web application also running in the cloud, but it hasn't always been a web app. In fact, some three years ago, we transitioned from a desktop version to a web app, and we had to make some decisions and choices about our tech stack for the web versions. Um, we tried to pick the best technologies for this uh, application. One of our choices, by the way, was running with Node.js at the back end and React uh, at the front end. And we also had to make a decision about which API style of technology to use. We mainly uh, debated between REST and GraphQL. And we picked GraphQL for internal API layer. And how did we make that decision? Well, we, uh, we listened to the internet. We read everywhere that it's time for REST APIs to REST forever, that REST should rest in peace that we should put REST to REST and that long live GraphQL, the new king of API styles. And uh, we got the message, uh, but jokes aside, choosing GraphQL for our internal API was an easy choice. Uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, theoretically, you just describe your data, ask what you want and get predictable results. <coughs> um, that's at least in theory. Uh, but GraphQL, unlike REST, which is server-driven, GraphQL is client-centric, and that allows the API client to ask for exactly the data the user wants. And there's a tight schema that describes the shapes of our data, our object model, so we don't have to decide on endpoints and verbs and resources in advance. And unlike REST, we're no longer tied to the notion of discrete resources, and this gives us a lot more flexibility when building maintaining and even when having to extend or, or change the API. Um, I said earlier that GraphQL is client-centric, so underfetching is avoided, right? Since we no longer are tied to these discrete resources or endpoints, you can query an entity along with all its related entities all in one query. 
And uh, also there's no overfetching because the clients specify <coughs> exactly the value, the fields they, they want. And what using GraphQL gave us is, well, increased velocity for our dev teams because once the schema is set, both the front end and back end teams can work independently. So it minimizes bottlenecks. And it is said that GraphQL gives better developer experience, especially for front end, um, front end developers because they don't need to run any post-processing of um, operations on, on responses from the API. No need to filter, reduce, and map. They just get exactly what they ask for. So we chose GraphQL because it's such a powerful technology that gave us better developer experience and from a client perspective, better performance compared to REST. <clears throat> and there are other benefits. And this worked well for us. We built a web app with GraphQL on the server side and client side. So we weren't really surprised when one day people from our product team came up to us and told us how our customers love the product. We said, oh, you know, we know we build it. But they also said that some of our biggest customers would like to automate processes to run scripts, to perform operation in large scale and so on against our web app. In other words, they were looking for programmatic access into our service. In other words, they were asking, you have an API. And uh, well, we looked them in the eye, that's our product people, we sighed for a second and then we said, hell yeah, we have this GraphQL API that gives exactly uh, the functionality that our customers need and we can make it into a public API. And it's GraphQL, who wouldn't wanna work with such a cutting edge technology that gives such great developer experience? Well, apparently our customers, they, they insisted on, on REST. I guess they didn't get the memo that REST is dead and it's time for it to REST forever. Uh, but actually they did have good reasons to ask for REST. I guess one of the reasons was that they were used to REST APIs in our previous APIs and it didn't make much sense to them to transition to a new technology just for that new API. And there are other good and perfectly valid reasons to want to work with a REST API. So yeah, one love indeed. There are actually more than four verbs, but simplicity is part of the beauty of REST. Uh, REST is simple to use and well-known and tried and tested in large scale for decades. And so REST APIs have become the de facto standard for companies deploying public API. Uh, for a developer, REST is simple. It's common knowledge. There's no need for any special libraries. And all that is partly due to the fact that REST leverages HTTP conventions and semantics, and, and that makes it easier for developers. I'm not sure why I put this slide here, maybe to show that REST uh, still has a place in our world. But anyway, back to our problem, we realize we now have a problem, which is we have an existing internal GraphQL API that we're already invested in, but our customers want a public REST API with just the same functionality. So what were our options? We could develop a, a new REST API um, from scratch manually, which is just a lot of work um, to give the same functionality or manually wrap uh, that GraphQL API with REST, which, which is kind of the same amount of work, but maybe with more limited results. <clears throat> we realize it's just not cost effective to both develop, test, and maintain two code paths with just the same functionality, and then also strive to keep them in, in parity over time. So we were looking for something else. We were looking for some magical way to expose our GraphQL API as REST with all the necessary translation. We wanted to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, so we did some research. Well, we Googled, and we found so many libraries and blog posts and tools about how to make your REST API into GraphQL, but not the other way around, not vice versa. There wasn't uh, a known tool, at least back then, to make that conversion to convert GraphQL to REST. So we decided to write one. I was the one who wrote it, at least I was the main contributor, which is why I'm here today. I also admit I gave it the very inspiring name, GraphQL to REST. And well, GraphQL to REST is a Node.js library that reads your GraphQL schema and automatically generates an express router uh, with fully RESTful HTTP routes. It's a full-fledged REST API. And 
Basically, it wraps your GraphQL with REST and works by reading your schema and a manifest file that you, the user, provides. That manifest file describes the way you want the resulting REST API to look. And that's required because uh, there isn't a simple one-to-one -one mapping between GraphQL and REST, especially if you want the resulting REST API to be truly RESTful <coughs> and your underlying GraphQL schema was like ours, which is very unrestful. It's more like RPC style. So it's a declarative approach um, where you describe how your REST API should look, and then GraphQL to REST generates it to map to the GraphQL layer. And we uh, open sourced it. So feel free to uh, check it out, use it, and contribute. Just look for GraphQL to REST of GitHub or NPM. This is how it looks like on GitHub. And I just want to spend a few minutes now to tell you how GraphQL to, L to REST works. Basically, there are two steps. Uh, one is pre-processing the GraphQL schema. And the second one is at runtime, creating those REST routes, which consist of that REST API based on the manifest. So the first stage, GraphQL to REST pre-processes the GraphQL schema. It reads that schema and uh, it parses all queries and mutations and generates client queries, which are fully exploded GraphQL client queries. What does that mean? Uh, it means that these are client queries that expand on all fields and all nesting levels and all possible variables per each query and mutation types. And then it saves those queries as static files, as GQL files, as you can see here. So, um, those files are generated, and this is just a one-time process. This, this pre-processing stage is, is, is something you have to do just once. You can run it offline as a script or at build time, um, unless the schema changes often. So every time the GraphQL schema changes, that pre-process stage has to run. Usually, most schemas are static, at least for, for, uh, for a while. So um, besides that, there's that manifest file I was talking about. Um, in which we describe, or the user describes, all the REST endpoints, customizations, and mappings to uh, GraphQL operations. And that's it. At runtime, there's a fu one function called init, which initializes that API. It loads all those GQL files into memory, those uh, generated during the pre-process stage. It reads the manifest JSON file and uses Express Router to generate REST endpoints and routes associated with the GraphQL operations and rules defined in the manifest. So in it returns an Express.js router, which basically uh, is mounted with all the REST API endpoints and consists of the API. So <coughs> at real time, when a client invokes a uh, REST API call, that Express.js router uh, picks up the phone, so to speak. It knows um, which GraphQL client query to uh, to associate with that specific uh, API request, populated with the REST parameters, and invoke that GraphQL operation against the GraphQL server, which could be local or remote. It gets a response from GraphQL, runs some logic to decide if this is an error or success. It formats the response to look like REST, assigns the correct HTTP status code, and so on. And the user gets a, a response that looks like REST, and they're completely agnostic. They don't have to know that basically the under the hood, it's a GraphQL server that they've been interacting to, with. This is, um, well, I, well, I mentioned the, the manifest JSON file. This is how it looks like uh, when it describes REST endpoints and mapping rules. This is the most basic minimal description for REST endpoints. So we have the name of the route path here, slash tweet, slash an ID parameter, the method, it's a get operation. Uh, and the GraphQL operation to map to. So whenever someone invokes get slash tweet slash one, two, three, four, the GraphQL query or mutation, in this case it's a query, get tweet by ID is being invoked with uh, the parameter ID with the value of one, two, three, four. This is very simple, uh, but we can add more rules and customizations if we want, if, if we want to. So this is a more complex example where parameters can be renamed, status code, can be uh, customized. We can change the structure of the REST request so it's going to be flat. 
which is uh, what you expect from a, from a REST request, omit some parameters and so on. And uh, code-wise, this library exposes just two functions, that pre-processing uh, function, generate GQL query files, and in it, at runtime. I'm not going to dive into the code, although it's pretty simple. Instead, I'm going to try and show a live demo. It's actually a non-live live demo that I pre-recorded just before uh, upgrading my version of Chrome. So this is uh, graphical, uh, which is a, uh, it's a playground for GraphQL. It's, it's, it's actually a GraphQL client, something like Postman for GraphQL, one might say. And here I'm exploring my schema, my list of uh, queries in, in this case, trying to find a, um, a query that's gonna be suitable for this demo to, sh to build an API endpoint around. So looking at my, at my queries, how about um, this query, get recent build logs, which accepts two parameters, Elastic Hugo ID, which is a UID, and from sequence number, which is an int, and it returns a build log entry, an array of build log entries. It looks like this. So when I run it, I prepared this in advance. This is just a GraphQL query. Uh, I populated a valid UID and a valid integer, and these are all the, the fields that I want to get. So when I run this operation, I get a response, just a simple GraphQL response. It's an array of objects, in this case, an array of build log entries. Now this is GraphQL, right? It's client-centric. It means that I can, as a client, as a user of, of this API, I can select which fields I'd like to get. So let's just ask for message and verbosity. <coughs> and when I run it now, I get all those objects, but just with the fields that I wanted. So this is classic uh, GraphQL. Let's see if we can make a REST endpoint around this GraphQL query using this library GraphQL to REST. So the first stage is to edit that manifest file and to describe the endpoint that I'd like to create. So we have to name it first. What should be the name of this REST endpoint? So the GraphQL operation or query was get recent build log. This is not a very RESTful name. Uh, it's kind of RPC style. In REST, we have uh, resources. So what is the resource here, really? I guess uh, logs, right? So slash log slash build. Sorry, slash log slash build. And then um, elastic cubo ID is the parameter I like to pass as a path parameter. That, that makes sense, at least to me. It's a get operation. And I'm mapping it to the GraphQL operation, get recent build log. So when I save that manifest file, the, the service restarts in the background and I can switch to Postman and um, run an API query. I populated that parameter, that query parameter, and when I run it, I get a response. And that response is an array of objects, just like what I expected, an array of build logs, but this is just a flat array. It doesn't look like a GraphQL response. It's just a, a, a regular standard uh, REST API response. We get a 200 OK. That's good. Now, what about that uh, parameter that we saw earlier in, in the GraphQL query? It was called uh, from sequence number. It's some kind of pagination parameter. I can pass that automatically. This, is ha this happens automatically uh, under the hood as a query parameter and specify, I gave it the value, I think, of 35 because there are 35 or 36 objects in that array. This is how uh, Postman sees that. So when I send it, I get an array with just one object. That means it worked, the mapping worked, and I was able to pass in that parameter as a REST query parameter that the GraphQL layer picked up. What if I just, uh, we saw earlier that for a GraphQL operation, I can, I can filter uh, on the fields I want, just specifying the fields I want. Is there an equivalent in REST? Well, the answer is yes. GraphQL to REST gives us a built-in parameter, a filter parameter called fields. Um, we can change its name, but I use the default value, which is field, and I can specify exactly the fields I want. Let's pick up verbosity and uh, 
message. So when I hit send, I get a single object with still 200 OK, yeah, single object with the fields that I asked for. And if, if I omit that from sequence number parameter, that filter still is still applied on each and every object. And this is something we get for free. We don't have to write any code. It's part of that library that translates between GraphQL and, and REST and gives us those capability. So we managed to uh, create a REST endpoint that's mapped to that GraphQL query. Uh, that's good. What if I want to customize my REST API? For example, let's do something crazy and change the success code to um, 202. Doesn't make much sense here, but just for the sake of the demo. And let's change the parameter name. Uh, that parameter name um, from sequence number is actually, it's a pagination parameter, right? So it's like a skip parameter. So uh, for me, for a REST API, it, it makes more sense to just call it skip. So the graph QL layer is left kept unchanged, for, but for my REST API, I like to change it to skip. Uh, we change, we save the manifest file, the service restarts in the background. Let's see if this works. I'm, I'm passing in the value of skip. This is how the URI looks like. So skip 35 instead of the previous parameter name. <coughs> it's 202 accepted, just like we requested. And there is just a single object, which means that had that pagination worked, that parameter mapping worked. Uh, I configured this as a get operation in the manifest, but I could have um, said it to be a post or a put or a patch operation, then pass parameters uh, in the body, but it makes more sense for it to be a get operation. Another thing I'd like to do is hide some parameters. Maybe the, the GraphQL API in this case is an internal one, but the REST API is a public one. And in that public one, we want to um, hide some fields, always, forever. So using this hide property, it's an array of properties that could be nested uh, fields, but in this case, I just chose top level field to hide from the response. These are the field server name and type value, which is an object. So when I rerun the operation, I will see they're gone. So we have that control over how the REST API should look like. What about error validation? Usually in REST APIs, we have to take care of error validation. But since under the hood, it's GraphQL, and GraphQL enjoys uh, a strongly typed schema and auto validation as a result, we get it for free here. So skip, which was previously uh, the from sequence number parameter, is, in, is defined to be an integer. So when I try to send in a string, I get an error, a pretty verbose error coming from GraphQL. It doesn't look like a GraphQL error because it's uh, processed, but I get that for free. Same thing if I uh, um, mess with the UID. We get that validation for free from the GraphQL layer. So we managed to uh, uh, build a REST endpoint based on an existing GraphQL endpoint and customize it with only, what, six or seven lines of JSON, uh, which is what I was aiming to do. So back to the slide deck. So GraphQL to REST works with any type of GraphQL server. It could be local, uh, remote, using a polar link or FAT, and you can customize almost everything. I, I demonstrated a few customizations, but you can customize the response format, the error format, status code, change parameter names, uh, hide fields, and so on. And using this library, we automatically generated a truly RESTful API without writing a single line of code. And this enabled us to provide a RESTful public API based on the existing GraphQL layer while keeping the internal GraphQL API unchanged to drive our existing UI. In fact, we could not change that GraphQL API because it was already driving our UI in production. We just wanted a REST API to uh, ride on top of it to serve as a public API. So we got to enjoy both worlds. And if you want to try and have your cake and eat it too, you can uh, get this package from NPM and, and check it out. Uh, you might find it good for your needs as well. Now, I see I have some time left, and I'd like to discuss really briefly the questions of, okay, let's say if you were to develop a 
public API for your clients or partners today, would you or should you go the GraphQL path or the REST path? So we saw that for the internal API case, there are obvious benefits. Is there any reason not to choose GraphQL for an internal API? And the answer is yes. GraphQL doesn't shine in all use cases. It shines when there are many entities and relationships between them and for queries uh, of complex data. So get operations, not so much um, um, operations that create and modify objects or RPC-like operations. So um, if your public API is not going to have a lot of uh, complex queries or you, your data model is not a, cannot be modeled as a graph, it doesn't make much sense to expose it as a GraphQL API because GraphQL shines for queries. Uh, there are issues with uh, caching because GraphQL uses HTTP post. It's solvable, it just requires extra libraries. I think the biggest issue is with error handling because um, GraphQL does not rely on HTTP status codes. It's always 200 okay. So it's up to the client to parse the body, to extract the error and decide what is the issue. And there's actually a number of other issues, uh, but all these issues, although the real issues, all, have, all of them have proper solutions uh, in, in, in most languages and stack. You just need to make an extra effort on the client side to implement them. So for the internal use case, uh, this is a matter of choice. And there's still a strong use case for using GraphQL as an internal API. But what about a public API? And what's the difference? So this is uh, just a short list of companies, of the bigger companies that offer a public GraphQL API side by side with the REST API. In fact, GitHub uh, actually migrated to GraphQL in their last API version, v4. They offered their v4 API only as GraphQL. So there's no more v4 REST API for GitHub, at least uh, the last time I checked it. And uh, this was a brave move. And this is what they say, GitHub, on going for GraphQL public APIs. They say that since their application engineers are using the same GraphQL platform that they're making available to their integrators, it provides them with the opportunity to ship UI features in conjunction with API access. So they get parity guaranteed by design. Also, it is a form of dog fooding where the dev team eats the same dog food as their users or clients. But there are issues uh, for going with GraphQL as a public API. And those issues stem from the fact that GraphQL is client-centric not server driven, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse. Because uh, some users say that GraphQL moves too much of the burden to the user of the API. Uh, you know, sometimes users just want to get, you know, run a, a get operation, use an API token, and, you know, get the data, and don't want to spend time exploring your schema. They would say that query building is tedious and so on. Um, there could be a large learning, learning curve for uh, people and teams interested in using GraphQL. And, and in the internal use case for an internal API, your team would have a vested interest in introspecting the API, but an external de developer might not. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, if you want top client-side performance, you might need external libraries. The uh, issue of errors. Um, is this an error? What is an error? Because um, GraphQL does not leverage HTTP errors. Now it's now on your user, your client, to um, to check for errors and write their own logic for monitoring and errors. So using REST means using a familiar framework, and it means minimizing the business risk and de-risking. So these are all good reason not to go with GraphQL API. Um, as a public API. So what is the conclusion? Well, I don't think there is any, any definitive conclusion, but at least my opinion is that <clears throat> GraphQL is a great technology, but definitely not a silver bullet. And there are very good tech reasons to choose GraphQL for a public API too, but there are also other considerations. For example, market penetration of GraphQL. The more public GraphQL APIs we see out there being offered and used, 
the more GraphQL becomes more mainstream for the public API use case and the easier it is for us to release uh, public GraphQL APIs because the adoption rate will be higher. But right now, that not might be the case. So when we uh, have to make the choice, we have to take into account our public API user preferences, habits, needs, and skills. And uh, one way is to gather information and survey our customers and developers in advance. That's not always possible. So uh, you could either take a leap of faith like GitHub did, or if you uh, do decide to go the GraphQL route, you can also try to expose it as REST using this library GraphQL to REST, um, and at least try to enjoy both worlds and minimize uh, the effort in writing two path codes. So thank you um, for having me. These are the links for the package on uh, GitHub and NPM. Also feel free to reach out to me on each of these platforms and LinkedIn, Twitter, and email. Um, I'm not sure we have time for questions. I can take some questions now, but it's uh, up to Thank the you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roy. That was really, really informative. Um, and it really has prompted quite a few questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. But if you are free, maybe you could stick around and answer some of them in the chat here. Sure. Really. Thanks for that.